things to pick up. We went straight for uh, where the rubber meets the road. So we have a wish list for the RBI. For the RBI. There's one regulator. Um, and it's, it's an eight point wish list. So I'll just go through that. So the, um, you know, our, our thinking was that some of the ideas we heard today, we would like them to flourish. So if they are to flourish, what kinds of things we would like to see, M mostly short term, you know, what kinds of fixes we would like to see. So this is what came out of the conversation. So one is on, on, EK, you know, on key EKYC. I had mentioned it earlier, what we did with, uh, with capital flows in Aditya Birla, it was actually OTP EKYC. Today, that's technically not permitted. So there is a lot of conversation going on in the RBI to try and figure out a process to, to, to make that happen. Perhaps one of the things, ideas that came out of here in a, in a tiered way, so we actually introduced a tiered KYC system. So up to a certain uh, limit on the account or up to a certain limit on the loan, you actually permit uh, OTP EKYC. And what that means is that as long as you have a phone, mobile phone, and that number is linked to Aadhaar, you can open an account anywhere in the country. So that's what it would enable. Then the other thing was that while we do have a framework for, for digital signatures, for e-sign, it's unclear whether, especially banks in particular, maybe less so from an NBFC perspective, that was a conversation you guys can correct me, that the compliance departments in particular are comfortable accepting that. So a contract that's actually digitally signed. Part of that is just the cultural change that needs to happen. But what can help is, is not necessarily regulation, but clarity from the RBI, something that says, we do endorse this, or we, we are comfortable with this, these are accepted in these conditions. Something along those lines, a circular, perhaps, that summarizes their view on the sort of fidelity of the digital signature, that was the second thing. The third thing was on, on KYC sharing, right? And I, I think our thinking was, we're having redundancies there's multiple, for the same individual who's been KYC multiple times in multiple services. I'll, you know, Aadhaar, the vision of Aadhaar is that it, it becomes the one time only, right? You get into the system and then that's leveraged throughout your relationships with service providers, lifetime as a resident in this country. Uh, but there's also another initiative which is on central repository. So RBI is already working towards that <coughs> KYC sharing repository. We think that is something that should happen sooner or later. Then, uh, so we were thinking about this ideas we discussed today, but we also were talking about the P2P lending platform uh, and, and P2P lending in general and the fact that that's in the offing, that you know, later this month the RBI will come up with something. And so we were wondering what it will permit and what it won't permit. And we started talking about what we would like it to permit. So one of the things we would like it to clearly clarify is, is individuals as lenders on the platform, the P2P platform. But individuals is really an example of an expanded sources of capital. So all sorts of other entities that can actually become the platform. Shashad reminded us that in fact in the US it's still 70 to 80 percent. The lenders are not individuals on the on P2P lending platform. So you, we want to make sure that it's a, it doesn't restrict it to a certain class of institutions. And it permits a broader subset, and ideally even individuals. And then uh, we had, uh, we talked about the, you know, the RBI actually holding the torch on the consent framework. So the saying that it, it actually regulates what it means to give consent for data to be used. So consent exists legally today. Uh, uh, thanks to someone, Sahil knows who's looking into that. <laughs> um, uh, and um, uh, you know, but the it, it's a very flimsy framework. Frankly, it's, it's a I should say flim it's not a, it's not clear. It's not well defined. It could be strong. It, the fact that it exists itself is very very good. Like what I mean by that is, let's take the Telecom Universal Services Agreement that's enforced by Tri. It does say, not in very specific language, that you can in fact share data with a third party with consent, but it doesn't say what that consent is, what does it look like, what does it mean, is it enforceable, is it tackle proof, et cetera, et cetera. So we need something more on that, and perhaps the RBI holds the torch on that even though it impacts other regulatory domains. 
then uh, we wanted um, uh, something that seems like could be an easy fix, but is, is, hasn't happened yet, which is that if there's a time lag when data gets reported to the credit bureaus. So I don't know if someone actually has an active loan as of yesterday. Time. So, would, why can't that change? It's ultimately a digital world. We should have a So, we would like to a speedier process and understand why it's in fact the way it is right now. And perhaps that's another thing the RBI can, can do for us, establish list. Then, on the P2P uh, lending platform, as a, as, a, as a business itself, as a platform itself, we had some questions about how it might get regulated, like what kind of entity would be licensed to be a B2B lender. So it, would it be a specialized NBFC? And then if it is a specialized NBFC, would it have high capital requirements? And is that the way the RBI will keep out certain entities we might consider to be more innovative, right? So it's the way it might set the bar too high and really you know, give these specialized NBFC licenses to you know, phenomenally well-capitalized incumbents today, let's say, you know, who would really <coughs> give it the ability to experiment with a very new innovative model. So we wondered whether that's a, that's innovation friendly at the end of the day. And the last thing was, you know, things like what we showed, right? The India stack, the fact it's a three minute loan, you know, obviously does that open the floodgates for for fraud, abuse, it's, you know, it's unsecured lending models could, could be built on that. What are the protections around that? And, and what kinds of actions do we need? So for, for example, this short, shorter time, for reporting to the credit bureau enables that. Right? So the faster, more data being shared in the right way and faster will, will be our best bulwark against any kind of abuse of the system like this. It will be the best thing we can use. Um, there's no foolproof mechanism. We all know that in the lending business. But something like that would, would help. So this is our this is our wish list for just for the RBI. We have we didn't get to the try. Next, next Thank you. Um, now, team three, focus on technology. Hi, everyone. Uh, we focused in on technology as an enabler, as you mentioned. Um, the first step in this process was just to outline what are all of the different sources of data, specifically alternative data, that we can leverage to be better, better lenders. Um, so, so we walked through some of them. They, they vary in, in how alternative these apps or starts actually are. Um, but the, the company I work for uh, began leveraging or creating psychometric data. As long as you can enter a survey, you can provide data on your creditworthiness to the lending institution. Um, as one of these data sources. Sybil, of course, is there. Um, we'll be talking a little bit more about how Sybil, Crystal, these traditional data sources might work um, as complementary data sources to these alternative data sources. Um, we also talked a little bit about um, bank statements and accounting data as being one of the most valuable insights into a company. Again, so long as, as mentioned earlier, it's verifiable in some way. Um, again, whenever you have a new data source, the key challenge is being able to verify and validate that information that you've received. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, gathering data through interactions um, with customers, with suppliers, through a templatized format, and later, being able to match that data up against bills and invoices as a form of perhaps more personnel intensive, but also um, very reliable way of uh, leveraging alternative data. Um, with each of these sources of alternative data comes a different degree of friction that your borrower will encounter. If you're visiting all the suppliers, uh, checking in on all the employees in the organization, Right, a certain type of borrower will be okay with that. A certain type of borrower will not be okay with that. So, primarily, when you're thinking about what's best to operationalize, you need to think not only in terms of what's good and predictive in a credit assessment, but also what is my borrower willing to endure. Um, 
running through the list here, we talked about uh, supply value chain as a very, very important source of data. Um, capital flow, of course, is leveraging a lot of this value chain information uh, with the emergence of online lenders of supplying finance to e-commerce uh, suppliers. Uh, this is going to be a richer and richer source of information. Um, Neo Growth is doing a lot of exciting and interesting work, work looking at POS information and using that as something that is abs absolutely verifiable um, and absolutely seamless when it comes to providing finance and collecting money from, uh, from a lending institution. And then when you think more traditionally today when you hear about alternative data as a buzzword, um, you think about social, social media data, you think about call detail records, um, telecom data, and you think about GIS, location information. Each of these data sources is important and will be essential for lenders that are serving SMEs and MSMEs in the future. The key consideration for them is, of course, privacy, um, something that the regulation team will be able to talk a little bit more about. But how do you ensure that someone has really opted in to provide you this information? And how do you ensure that you are not overstepping any bounds um, with the information that you're using? Um, now, the, the jury's still out on these data sources and on what they can do in different macroeconomic environments. Um, if there's an economic downturn, does that mean that my social data is still gonna be predictive, or am I better off in those circumstances weighing more heavily on bank statements? Um, so the jury's still out, is our consensus on that. Um, we took a look at uh, credit bureaus and what their role should be in relation to this alternative data landscape. Um, some of the work that we've done at EFL, nobody I'm a part of, um, has been extremely supportive of the fact that each of these data sources is valuable, but is also distinct. The information a bureau has is different from the information that you'll get from a social media platform, or that you'll get from someone's psychometric profile. And the more that can be done, to combine these data sources, the better decisions that lending institutions will be made. So while, it, while I won't say that bureaus should be the only ones um, dabbling in alternative data, but I will say that there's a lot of synergy and there's a lot of additive power in combining as many of these different data sources as possible. Um, we looked, we, we, we were, dis we discussed in depth uh, the major need or the potential for digitizing as much of the underwriting process, the collections process, as is possible. And something that stood out as a key challenge for us, and I'm sure for many of the lenders here, was property records and the digitization and verifiability of pro property records. Um, that being said, we know that it is possible for a completely digital lending process and underwriting process to occur. Um, firms here, like R2, for example, specialize in creating digital templates for the entire underwriting process. Um, so the primary concern when it comes to what can and cannot be digitized comes down to what can and cannot be verified. Um, the key element that stood out for us was property records. Um, and the last thing that I'll, that I'll talk a little bit about is uh, we, we, we t I went through very quickly a lot of different potential data sources. Um, what's what's going to be sort of the mover and shaker um, in, in, in the upcoming five, ten years? Um, so I want to retract that statement. What's going to be uh, extremely additive in the next five or ten years? Um, we're seeing tremendous growth in smartphone adoption and usage across the nation. Um, it, we're seeing tremendous expansion of financial institutions' ability to access more people through the growth of small payment, uh, payments banks, small finance banks. And the way these 
individuals are going to be interacting with their banks is completely on their phones. Um, you look in Africa, in Kenya, for example, 80%, um, 90% of people never go into a bank branch at any point in time. Um, that is very likely the world that India will be running towards um, through the growth of smartphone usage and adoption and through the increased availability of call detail record information. Um, so that's sort of our outlook for the future. I think we had a great discussion and broadly we had a consensus that you know, the future is definitely going to look bright for all these paradigms which uh, are around lately. And we would become a data-rich society. We would become a more cashless society. We would become a more whitish gray society. And at least the people in this room aspire through their efforts, through their ventures, and through their funding, to really make India such a society. So even though uh, Adhika had a slightly different take in terms of how much data is currently available today to make a decent lending judgment, but all of us were in agreement that you know, the future is unfolding very fast where you can really have a very strong credit underwriting which can be made digital. And once you tie it back with various transactions, the repayment histories, and once you ensure that all the SME followers, promoters, directors, and everybody else understands that it is better for them and for their companies to come to the formal fold. And we make that barrier to entry for them to come to the formal fold easy they would stay that way. And that is what perhaps we are all aspiring for. The second question that we were discussing was that whether there is an opportunity for this aim to become and remain differentiated for a long while. I think just like any other business paradigm, <coughs> at some point of time we will see that many of these things will become commoditized. The advantage in India is that we are starting with a totally clean slate. So in fact, there is no chaos, there is no status quo, there is total vacuum in which we have started operating. And there is just so much that needs to be done. That for years, we would be able to create value for ourselves, our stakeholders, followers, and investors. And then at some point of time, when there would be a culmination of all our efforts, the space would become commoditized, but the numbers would be significant. So we would be talking about trillions of dollars you know, trillions of rupees that would be passing through our own platforms, digital platforms, by people like Capital Flow, people like Fun Steiger, and everybody else who are contributing to you know, give this system authority, including regulations, RBI, TRI, and you know, India's tech fellows who are doing a good job just ensuring that you know, the next million people and their aspirations and entrepreneurship dreams don't go shattered just because they are not able to find a decent channel of money or credit, which would become commoditized, which should become commoditized as well. Uh, we were also supposed to discuss about what the various learnings are from places like US, UK, and China. So two things uh, came up, and in fact, uh, there were two of my table partners who came from outside India, and both of them were of the viewpoint that, uh, you know, places like US and UK, because the financial institutions and the system has been there in existence for such a long while, so all these startups which are doing SAP financing, digital lending and all, are able to leverage those channels, whether it is with respect to you know, origination, sourcing, loan servicing, the recoveries, and also leveraging credit bureaus and histories, so that even if a credit decision does not go fully well today, you know, tomorrow hundreds of lenders know that here is a guy who defaulted on his payment and there is a certain price in terms of the increase in spread that this SME borrower is going to face once you know, things don't go right. So those type of things, those institutional mechanisms in India surprisingly have been very absent or they have been very difficult. But I think with the rise of technology, with the rise of data, and I think the government, institutions, and all of aspiring middle class, which really wants to be more data rich, which has now the means to become data rich with respect to the various you know, smartphones with respect to you know, ability to do transactions on their mobile, right? And with the aspiration that you know, I really don't want to uh, grease somebody's palm just because I want to run an honest business is something that we are all aspiring for, and in that sense, we would be competitive. The last point that we uh, discussed, actually, we did not discuss that point, 
the fourth point, which was that what is the future looking like for people who are lending out to their own balance sheets at this point of time? We could not take up that question because the time right now. But my personal opinion is that I think times are great for people who are really going to you know lend into their own loan box. And just as we had had a very successful MFI, you know, very successful impact investments and uh, you know, the whole wave that has come to India, which really filled up a huge gap that was there left by the formal banking system. I think the time has come that over the next four, five, ten years, we would see a strong SMB financing backbone that would be created in India by a uh, few players who are sitting in this room and also by players who are not in this room but are aspiring to you know, contribute to this ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, now we're going to have Sahil um, quickly summarize um, sort of the findings from the session. Um, firstly, thank you, everyone. I think it was a very lively discussion at all the tables. Uh, <coughs> and there was obviously some great content that came out of it. Uh, I understand we've held you back from lunch, so I'll be very brief. Um, I was actually surprised that all four tables ended up discussing data. Uh, but though it, it, it actually shouldn't be that surprising, right? Um, and that's I think that's a theme that has emerged from from the discussions here. Um, one of the things that uh, that really struck me uh, is us going from a data rich to a data poor. I mean, data poor to a data rich country very very quickly as as the number of smartphones keeps going up at uh, at the speed. Um, Try data actually indicates that we're adding, uh, that we have about 300 million mobile internet users and we're adding uh, about two crore people, 20 million users every quarter. So we'll have, uh, you know, well in excess of half a billion mobile internet users in another couple of years, like 2017 and 2018 sometime. Um, and another thing that that, that, that that seemed very interesting to me was that the business and the person, particularly at a small scale, are pretty much the same thing. They can't be divorced that easily. Uh, that's an interesting point that table number one made. Um, and to that end, when you talk about you know becoming data rich, you talk about the business and the person not being that separate from each other, the entire architecture that's being put in place, uh, uh, which is public architecture of the India stack, starting with the other. Um, uh, I was part of the early team at Aadhaar, so was Jamuna, we were there uh, in 2010. Uh, I, I joined about one month before the first Aadhaar number was issued. Uh, and the first Aadhaar number was issued on September 12th, 2010. Uh, it's amazing to think that just in five and a half years, barely six years, we've, we've crossed a billion. Uh, and here we are discussing an entire you know, multi-hundred billion dollar industry possibly in a couple of years uh, being built on that backbone. So I think um, you know, credit to be given where credit is due. Um, and they've not stopped there. I mean, uh, Nandan and his team and, um, and, and there's an entire team of volunteers uh, and an ecosystem of players that are working with that, with that stack. And there's a very clear, uh, there's, there's clarity of thought where you go from a unique identifier to be able to authenticate that identity and then to be able to uh, basically um, sign essentially and, and 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 the word sign here is is uh, people people don't understand what e-sign is because they think it's basically a wet signature or, or basically your signature digitized that's not necessarily that's not what it is it's actually a digital certificate it's a security certificate that uniquely ties to your number and uh, one of the reasons i mean and building awareness around what these products are and how they work and why they are you know, uh, non-reputable and why they are, uh, you know, tamper-proof in that sense and therefore actually much more secure than a wet signature when it comes to signing a document. Um, so taking that to the next step of, uh, af after e-sign you have um, essentially UPI where we've, we've, we've built the rails uh, but I think it will be another couple of years before we actually start seeing transactions happen on it. And the more we push for transactions to happen on it, the more clarity and the more data or, or the way I think Nandan calls it a digital exhaust. It's essentially a footprint of, of, of data wherever you go, of all your transactions. Right? Um, all of these things will start having massive multiplicative effects as you start uh, in the next couple of years. And I think uh, SME financing will be able to push further in the smaller industries than, than uh, and that was again a very beautiful insight 
that the ability to draw down debt is actually more when you're smaller than when you grow because there again the person and the business are kind of one and the same they meld together and, and as a ratio of you the size of your business is is more so it might not just be the 63000 registered entities but more the you know uh, millions and millions of small businessmen that are there that that are in desperate need of credit which are probably smaller in size so just like the largest quantum of recharges in in uh, in, in telecom are uh, 50 rupees and above, I, actually the highest quantum is around 10 rupees. Uh, I think uh, the largest quantum of SME loans will start pushing uh, much lower but in much higher volumes. Uh, and the only way to enable that at speed will probably be riding off of this infrastructure. Uh, that's all I had to say. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you know, We'll be around. Uh, we'd love to meet each and every one of you. You've met quite a few already. Um, and uh, let's see if we can do this again sometime. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.